uh, committee members here. Um, I'll, I'll just look down the list. I wonder if Catherine wants to quickly say hello. Hello, hello. Nice to see everybody. Nice yeah. to see you, Marcus. We've been communicating on the email. Nice to see you, Adrian, and everybody else. Great. Yeah, I know we have Paul Brown. Paul Brown's currently in Australia. I don't know if... Um... Yeah, it's about um, six, just after six o'clock in the morning here in Australia, and it's very hot. Um, uh, I'm an artist. I've been working with computers since the late 60s. And um, the CAT exhibition in the foyer of the BCS, which goes out next month, will be a 56-year retrospective of my work. So you're all welcome to, if you're in London, to, uh, to come and see that. Uh, I'm secretary of the society, which means I do hardly anything at all for it, um, though I do do try and help out now and again. So that's me. Hello, everyone. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, an important pioneering artist, aren't you? That um, Stephen Bell, do you want to quickly say a, a word? I'm right. Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting lots of new people um, and old people as well. I mean, old friends, um, as well as old people like myself. I started using uh, the computer at the Slade. Uh, 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 Paul was there at the same time. That was in 1977. So for me, computer art and all that associated with my head, the punk rock and that era. So really dates me, I'm afraid. But uh, yeah, but I'm particularly interested in uh, behavioral animation and, and interactive art and so on. And fascinated by anyone who might be able to amaze me with what they're doing. And I love supporting them doing that. I spent ages at Bournemouth University helping students learn how to program and how, how what enthusiasm, enthusing them about how creative programming could be. Uh, and I could get on a soapbox about this, but I went. It's lovely to see people, and I look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Great. And I think we also have um, Graham. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Graham Diprows. I am co chair of EVA London Conference, which is the Large, one of the largest conferences that BCS run and is sure as hell the largest conference that CAS has anything to do with. Uh, my uh, I'm a retired university lecturer, my own research these days is uh, looking at ways of sending digital photographs and their context forward four or five hundred years into the future. Great, thank you. Um, so I thought as, as they were here, it's worth you meeting a few of the organisation committee, and there are plenty more as well, but not everyone was available to come tonight. But I'm sure if you start to participate in our talks on a regular basis, you'll get to, to meet everyone. Um, and there will be opportunities maybe to um, have a discussion about your work and your interests um, as well. So what we're going to do tonight is just go through some of the things that Kansas has been up to recently, but importantly, what our plans are for the future. Um, now, I'm not sure where people have, have come from in terms of coming to this meeting, but some of you, I guess, will be very familiar with CAS because you've been involved with it for a long time. Or maybe you might haven't been involved with it for a long time, but you've been aware of it for a long time. There might be others as well who have joined our Facebook group and saw that there's a meeting coming up. And apart from the group being called Computer Art Society, that might be as much as you know about what CAS is. So, I thought this event would be useful just to talk a little bit about CAS, um, and I'm going to use our new website as a prop for that. And I'm going to hop around and show you a few things that will hopefully, um, oh, got a few more coming in here, um, that will hopefully give you more of an idea of what CAS does and perhaps um, ignite some interest in being more involved. We certainly want to provide opportunities for people to get involved, and I will mention a few of those a bit later on. So the first thing I'm going to do is connect or share my screen. Um, I checked this earlier, so I'm not one of those people who has to restart their computer, hopefully, to do it. Right, so hopefully you can see the CAS website. Does that look all right? Yeah, good, good, thumbs up, excellent. So if you haven't been here, computerartsociety.com with a dash between arts computer arts and society, that's our um, web address. That web address is quite well established, but the site has been completely refreshed. So I've got some work to do on making sure that all our links into that site 
work and don't return 404 errors and whatever, but that will happen. So this is our new website. This really only got finished on Monday. I've been working on it since the beginning of the year. Um, I've taken materials from our old website, but really I wanted to create a platform that we could build on and make sure that all of our activities get well documented on, including talks and we'll see some of the other things. So what you'll see here on the homepage is first of all, a bit about our current exhibition. So for those who aren't aware, Computer Arts Society is affiliated with the British Computer Society or just BCS as they like to be called, which is a professional body in the UK that has a really nice office in, or suite of offices in London. And they allow us to put on exhibitions. We can put on small exhibitions of print, but also if we have the resources to do so, we can take over the whole office and have a lot of interesting computer art. So what you'll see here is Ernest Edmund standing in front of his exhibition, which is currently on until the end of the month anyway, um, down in London. It's 20 framed pieces from his recent um, book that contains artworks and accompanying notes. Really interesting um, exhibition. And if I click on it, <coughs> you'll see that the plan is to take this exhibition, it's currently um, down in Moorgate, BCS, that's in London, is to bring this exhibition up to Leicester, where I'm based next month. And this is a little model for what we want to do a lot more of, which is to take an exhibition that we've produced for one venue and start showing it in others. Now, because I'm here in Leicester, I've secured access to a uh, nice space in Leicester. But other people who are interested in seeing these exhibitions on in their location, to stop every now and then to let people in, I don't want to leave people out there, should get in touch with us because what I think would be great would be to have a national or even international network of locations where these exhibitions can tour. Uh, we can send you the pictures to frame. They're a standard frame size, well, sort of fairly standard, A3+, plus, which is 19 inches by 13 inches. I don't want to say standard, I don't think any standards are in inches anymore, but um, it's quite, it's a nice size. Um, you can get a good A3 plus printer. I have one professional printer, so I'm able to produce the work to go on the walls. And Ernest's exhibition is up there at the moment. Um, I'm documenting it, so you'll see in a minute, pictures, exhibition notes. And then the one and only sell really for the evening is that there is a limited edition print available which is the exhibition poster from that exhibition. So it limits it to 20 and it's been signed by Ernest. And this is something we're going to look at doing on a regular basis as well, which is a little bit of fundraising to support our archival activities. Uh, one thing I'm very keen on and that the whole committee is very keen on is ensuring that Kaz's history is well captured. Now, you'll see in a minute that the early history, what I call Kaz 1 up until um, that 1984 has been very well documented. There have been some research projects which have captured a lot of that material and published it and that history is captured. But I'm, I'm personally interested in the next wave of history, which is sort of from 2004 until about 2020, 2021. And in order for us to capture all of that material, it's great to do some fundraising. So if you would like a copy of this print, it's on archival paper, archival links, signed by Ernest, drop, us a line, there we go, and I can reserve one and it will cost you 40 pounds. Um, and majority of that money goes into the computer art archive funds and helps us run future projects. Um, we're also producing a booklet. This will be a free PDF and anyone who orders the print will also get a printed copy when it comes out. So you'll see the exhibition we had anyway. This was our London exhibition. Um, Catherine's with us, she's speaking there. Um, and you're there as well. So we had a really quite nice event. Um, Ernest Edmonds is also recently turned 80, so it was a little bit of a party as well. And you'll see what the CAS offices look like down in London. Um, so we're just in this area here, but the main there's a main social area and smaller offices. So it's quite a nice place to show work. So exhibitions. <coughs> Again, you'll see the first exhibition of this sort that we put on was um, um, Jeff Davis's uh, micro arts work, and I've also shown this exhibition in Leicester. And we are putting together a schedule. Um, the schedule is here, it doesn't mean that everything is a foregone conclusion, things can change, but I thought it was important to have a schedule that we could work to. And then it would encourage people to get involved, hopefully, in planning this schedule in the, the longer term. So we currently have two locations, so BCS Moorgate, Ernest Edmonds, 
is on Paul Brown's retrospective will be on soon. And then we're going to have a members show during CAS, which is June, July, or sorry, during EVA, which is June, July, August. This will have a call out. We want to encourage CAS members to submit work that we can print and display. Um, so first of all, in the BCS Moorgate location, but potentially elsewhere. Um, we will, this will be a curated show. Hopefully we get more than 20 applications and we will then select the work to go into the show. It's hopefully a benefit being associated with CAS. And then we're going to do a look, oh, look at the work of Sue Golifer, the retrospective of her work. Uh, important pioneering artist who is a woman as well. Aren't enough women being represented in certainly the digital arts history. And that is being changed, I'm aware of that. Um, and then we also want to have a, a general look at um, women in digital art. That would include contemporary as well as historic artists. So these exhibitions will be the 20 print variety. But if we get resources, we'll upgrade them to include more original work maybe um, mini events to go with them and even 3D work all shown within the BCS um, Moorgate location. Now up in Leicester, I'm running on a slightly tighter cycle. I'm gonna be showing the exhibitions for two months and Ernest's exhibition will follow next month. And then I see Adrian's here. We're going to do an exhibition of his work with the Quantel paint box um, for two months. That will also come down to London. I'm hoping next year but it's partly down to how you and the committee curate that space and decide what's on, about exactly which slot it goes into. I will then bring the Paul Brown retrospective up here to Leicester, but I'll probably do a slightly bigger event. Um, we have a bit more space and I might show some original artworks and that sort of thing. And then for my Leicester showing, I also have some work that I want to be representing my local digital arts community. So. I'm producing a digital art pioneers exhibition. Leicester has an important place within digital art history. Um, and then New Generations, which is new work, new generative work by um, local digital artists. And then we have an annual digital art season. We're looking into 2024 now. I haven't really curated these, but hopefully you'll see the principle, multiple locations. Maybe you have one that we could add, taking these exhibitions. And uh, you've seen how Ernest exhibition is being documented. If you look at Jeff Davis's, so down in Leicester, up in Leicester or here in Leicester, as well as the prints, I also had his work running on screen. We had background material and we had exhibition cabinet showing ephemera related to it. So these exhibitions naturally lend themselves to being enhanced with additional context. So that exhibition happened in both Leicester and Moorgate. And if we look at one more, the CAS 50 collection, <coughs> This is slightly different in that this is our collection of original artworks. Something else to let in. And this exhibition was put together in 2018 for the 50th anniversary of the Computer Arts Society. And it included a large number, initially 12, now 24 artists who contributed work to the exhibition. And it has been exhibited quite widely, particularly around the anniversary time. What I call phase one, the first 12 artists were shown in Leicester. And then we move on Phoenix, Brighton. That's confusing. I just got confused myself there. Phoenix, it went down to Brighton. Then we had event two at the um, RCA, big exhibition happened during the EVA conference. And then a phase two, the second half of the um, work went up to Leicester. And then we had a very long exhibition, but not very visible. Uh, we put the work into the new BCS offices just before lockdown in January. Um, we had an opening and it looked great and then no one could get in for a year, but there we go, that was lockdown. So it was our longest running exhibition, but maybe not the highest footfall. And this work is being increasingly well documented. I've got some pictures here from the various showings at event two at the um, RCA, that's in Leicester, uh, that's Ernest and Doug Dodds, if you recognise him, that's down in Brighton and so on. So that was a, a big, well attended exhibition um, across multiple locations, CAS 50. So as you can see, we're sort of exhibitions, I think are very important, partly because they offer like little waypoints. If you give somebody an opportunity to show a collection of work, it gets them to reflect a little bit and it allows us to reflect on an artist's work rather than just seeing one or two pieces at a time. It's nice to look at a body of work. Uh, but also, like I say, if these could be touring around, 
we could be raising the profile of digital arts, but also the computer art society in multiple locations. Um, so we have these. I just mentioned the others, I've mentioned those already actually, but I'll be very interested in hearing proposals for exhibitions. So at the moment, I guess the criteria is that they need to be sort of coherent um, in the sense that curated, be it by the artist or by us. Um, and printable. At the moment, we're looking predominantly for print-based exhibitions, but if we get resources, we would like to be able to upgrade them to include um, additional material. So there you go. If you go to the website, you can have a closer look at the exhibitions. So that's one thing we're looking to do, and we are doing. If you also look at talks, now CAS, from its origins, has been a very important place for artists to come together and share information and talks, and throughout its 50-year history, and that was a gap in the middle, but throughout, throughout its history, it's organized a huge number of talks. Actually, what I'm trying to do is see if I get a definitive list of all the people who've spoken at Kansas. That's quite an ongoing project. We have this talk here. Next, and um, Paul is going to talk a little bit about this. We have the first and what will be a series of talks about AI. And we're going to look at the history of AI in the arts first. And I'll, I'll hand over to Paul, uh, not just yet, and when I finish doing this demo, Paul, I'll give you a chance to talk a bit more about this. But this will be the first in a series of events where we're looking at different aspects of AI. So for me, if CAS has a role, an important, unique role, it's that we can connect contemporary artists with their history. And computer artists, digital artists are terrible at being aware of their history. And every other, every other art form is aware of its history. Give me a, show me a painter, and there will not be a single painter in the world who's not aware of their history, apart from maybe the person who paints your house or something. Um, but if you're an artist, you will be aware of your history. Digital artists can come up with an idea, they'll put it out, they'll claim it's highly original, it might be an interesting piece of work, but in many cases they'll have really very little awareness of their history. So one thing I think we can do in this really important debate around the use of AI is to show that some of the questions being asked are not brand new. People were asking these questions 40 years ago. What does it mean to create an original? What does it mean to collaborate with a machine? What does it mean to delegate your creativity to a machine? They're important questions, and these questions have been discussed. So we'll start by looking at the history. We'll then look at text-based AI. We'll then look, we'll have a more interesting title, and that's confirmed, image-based AI. And then we're going to bring in the Art AI Festival, which is a regular event that for the last few years, I think it's done three, has been looking at AI in the arts. And so we'll bring in some of the artists and curators. And then I think we've already decided that our evening at the EVA conference, and Graham will talk a bit more about EVA conference a bit later. I think our evening is going to be about AI as well. We can't get away from it. It's a very important topic. And then in the autumn, we're also putting together a speaker series. Um, and we've got some provisional, uh, well, a couple of, a booked speaker, but also some provisional ones in here. So every month, apart from a gap, which will be holiday times in August and um, post Christmas, January, those two we won't have talks, but every other month we will have a talk on the last Wednesday of the month. Um, now these we're putting together, obviously send recommendations, but if we feel that there's opportunities or a need to have more, it doesn't have to be monthly, we could put additional talks in. Or if you wanted a specialist talk as a member that only involved 20 people, put that in and we'll include it in our calendar. I think it's all about dialogue and we can have these dialogues through a speaker's program. Now, maybe Paul, you could say a little bit more about the history of AI talk, which we're currently taking bookings for on Eventbrite. And that will be end of next month, last Wednesday of March. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, for the history of AI talk, um, we'll be focusing on the 1970s and in particular, the relationship between the Slade School of Fine Art and Leicester Polytechnic. And uh, the Slade in the early 70s acquired a data general Nova 2, which for its day was an incredibly powerful mini computer. It had 16K of memory and you had to fiddle about on the front switches to make it work. It was more, I think the, the, the guy who ran that department, Chris Briscoe, uh, in an interview I did with him, he said it was more like a piece of laboratory equipment than a, a modern computer. But it, it, it attracted a lot of people. Harold Cohen was a regular visitor, Edward Donadovich was a regular visitor, and Ernest Edmonds was a regular visitor. And Ernest was uh, just setting up his program at Leicester Polytechnic. 
And so there was uh, an interplay between those two departments and quite a few people who graduated um, from the postgraduate course at the Slade went on to do a PhD with um, Ernest. And so this uh, session uh, will look at that period and that relationship. Um, and uh, so that's, that's 29th of March, seven o'clock. We're looking at four speakers, about 15 minutes presentation each. Uh, Catherine will moderate this, the session uh, and then uh, Ernest, uh, Stephen and myself will talk uh, for about 15 minutes with about 30 minutes discussion afterwards. So that's the program for the evening and I look forward to seeing many of you there. Thanks, I think that'll be Yeah, that'll be a great session. And I think in the bigger context of this series of talks about uh, AI, it's going to ground us. And like I say, these important questions that all the AI artists and the media is asking about AI have been investigated for 40 years. Now, OK, the technology has changed, but the questions aren't just about the technology. There are other philosophical, um, important, creative um, aspects to explore. Um, what we're also doing is ensuring that our talks are all archived. So I've started to put an archive together of some of our recent talks, but also the lockdown talks that we had. Some of you may have attended these. And then prior to that, everything else I found, these are now all on YouTube, but this provides a little index of those talks. Um, and also CAS50 as well. And if you're interested in going further back, you can look at the events program, 2018 to 20, recent one, back to the 2004 re-establishment of CAS. Um, and also, that'd be great for someone to do a bit of research into speakers in the early CAS. And they'll all be in the page magazine, I'm sure. Um, so we have that. So exhibitions and talks. This is forming what we're calling, I can hear a sound actually. I, I don't know who to mute. Sounds a little bit like um, a pencil sharpener, but I'm sure it isn't. It's top now. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Um, so that's our talk series. Archiving the talks is important. I'm going to archive this as well. Everything will go up on the YouTube channel and be linked in here. So talks and exhibitions. These form what we're calling the core program, which will be a talk most months, apart from um, January and August. It will be a regular face-to-face -face meeting, but with an online element that will take place, I think probably in February, July and November or December. Um, and then of course, the exhibitions, which we'd like to be able to upgrade and also distribute further afield. So these are all covered within the um, new website. We'll also be announcing things that we're doing via our news. And also, if you want to then look at a bit more about the Computer Arts Society, we have a slightly enhanced um, history of, but I think there's some work to be done here actually in updating our history and um, maybe a thing to look at, with, well, I'll come on to a few other things in the archive, is integrating more of our archive into this history. Okay, and now I'm just gonna flip back to the homepage again. So we left, look at Ernest's work. Latest news, forthcoming events, the exhibitions that we're currently putting together, um, online talks, and then this element here from the archive. Now, because I'm interested in archiving, computer arts history, and I know how to make websites, I've done a certain amount of work on our previous website, but I realized it was using a content management system, and I'm finding that if you want your web archive to last, they should be clean, straightforward HTML that can't break and will still be working in 100 years time. So I've been working on making sure our archive is, everything, is properly documented and listed as a website, not a content managed WordPress system, or whatever. So I've taken things from the existing site, which well, is there, including, for example, our documentation on event two, and link those into our archive. Notice it says old site up there, so you know where you are. CAS 50, you can see the artists in the CAS 50 collection, and I will be expanding this to include another wave of collecting. But then some early websites that CAS produced, so Computer Arts and Techno Cultures was a very important project that resulted in the handover of a lot of early Computer Arts Society materials to the BNA. And that's why one of the reasons why uh, the UK has such an amazing collection of early digital art at the BNA. Um, Nick Lambert's thesis, a uh, really interesting examination of um, computer art. And then the CASH project, 
which I think amongst others Catherine was involved in, and Paul actually. <laughs> Uh, this has, is the project, the original project website that tied it up to make sure it works and all the links, and then as possible links are removed. And this was the one that began this archiving of the Computer Arts Society's early work. And for example, that was a randomly picked one. All of these images were in the early CAS archive, and I believe they've all gone over to the VNA. So these have been saved. Whereas, as we know, what can often happen to important work, it can be skipped, it can be thrown away and without people realising what they've lost. So this was a very important project in terms of ensuring that British computer art history, CAS history was documented. That's still available in our archive. If you go to the archive page itself, that's this one here, archive. Nice picture of um, uh, Nick Lambert here um, and George Madden, one of the founders of the Computer Arts Society and his wife, Sarah. A little bit of background about CAS, and then you'll see what's happening in terms of development of the archive. So you've seen a couple of these things. I'm making sure that our exhibitions go in the archive, talks and so on. But I've also identified gaps where we need to make sure that these things are, are documented properly and saved in a form that means they will last. They won't disappear because um, uh, WordPress goes bust or something like that. You want it in pure HTML so that these won't be lost. And certain things here are under progress. So in the dark, I've documented Nance and Control exhibition, the VNA and elsewhere. And then some of these CAS projects, technology is not neutral, very interesting project um, that looked at women in digital arts, technology is not neutral, Brown and Son, art that makes itself. I've got some great materials related to that. That was at Waterman's, the Waterman's Symphosia that CAS was involved in. Um, I have some good materials there. Computer Drawing Exhibition, I curated that, my first um, computer art exhibition here in Leicester 2015, and the associated activities around that, um, and various other exhibitions that CAS has supported in some way, and Ernest Edmonds, Intuition and Ingenuity, Art Inspired by Alan Turing, um, Catherine's Computer Image of the Month, a good, a good example here of why it's important to capture stuff. So <coughs> these were published in the British Computer Society's magazine, um, obviously, if you don't have a copy of it, you wouldn't have it. So they then went online, but because the content management system has changed at the BCS, they're now not particularly well formatted or in a useful format. At least most of them are there. So that's why we need sometimes to download materials, reformat it in a way that can go into our archive and be maintained over time. Um, and now we're going back 2010, ideas before their time, um, symposium, uh, about the outcome of the earlier research projects, uh, uh, index of uh, some important exhibitions and events, decoding the digital. This was my first CAS event, I realized actually. I came along in 2009. This was a series of events, again, coming out of the research project, um, CAS and uh, computer arts and techno cultures. And then a bit of additional documentation, um, a little bit about what the VNA has. That was once in the CAS collection. That you'll find all of that in the VNA's archive. And here we go, speaker program. So this is the speaker program captured from <coughs> 2014. In some cases, there's not a lot of information. Well, I suppose that's not bad. There was this talk being held, Imperial College. Um, so I think there'd be a really interesting bit of research to look at all the artists who've spoken, certainly in this phase, but ideally in the earlier phases of CAS as well. Um, we've got Page Magazine which continued, was established in the first phase of CAS, but continued afterwards. Maybe a printed publication in this form isn't quite so relevant now, but we will be doing some output along those lines. There's Nick's thesis and the CASH project. And then if you go back further in time, the earlier collection of um, CAS, you'll see that we've kept, and these are, this has come directly, I think, from the CASH archive, John Lansdowne's Computer Bulletin, another co-founder of CAS, information about the Interact exhibition, <coughs> And then I want to ensure that we document eco game. You know, Catherine's looking at computer graphics 70, I think very important early computer art activities. Event one, uh, Kaz's first event, 50 years before event two. The early ed editions of Page, and then you can go right back and look at the aims of Kaz in its original booklet. So archiving is important within the context of this website. Um, and what I um, and I, I, I say I at the moment, what I'm doing, I've been working on the website, but I'm more than happy to share this 
If other people want to get involved in creating this site, that would be great. Um, what we have at the moment is if you look at talks, I'm trying to tie everything that we're doing now in a more contemporary way with links into the archive so that researchers in particular, so I keep saying it, but if somebody wanted to research all the talks that have ever happened at CAS across the years, this would be a good starting point for them. Okay, so we're along here. I've mentioned the archive. And just before I um, move on, contacts. So these are the people who signed up to be involved in CAS. So we have to have a number of named um, posts. We need to have a chair and we need to have a treasurer. Most computer or most um, BCS, British Computer Society organizations also have a communications or secretary person. And also we have George Bannon, our professor emeritus. And then we have committees whose role it is, is to put the time in they have and to get involved and help us make good decisions about how we develop things in the future. Um, I think we've got enough com committee members, but I think we should also consider other people coming in as well, um, if they feel that they can offer something. Um, membership, well, oh, I'm gonna make a second pitch, okay. Um, join in the Computer Arts Society. At the moment, all you have to do is join our mailing list or join our Facebook group and we regard you as a member. But there may come a point where we look to do something a little bit more official, um, but we can discuss that. That's open for discussion. So membership might involve possibly a donation, but more likely some sort of little commitment to the society. We'll look at what that's going to be. I also mentioned that the Computer Arts Archive, which I'm going to show you more of in a sec, um, cost money to run and we're also trying to push the idea of donating to the computer arts archive and as mentioned that's one of the reasons we're looking to sell things like earnest print just to give us some money money and i'm going to turn this into an etsy shop so we'll have printed versions of catalogs occasional prints this that and the other <coughs> within our shop and if we can raise a little bit every year that covers some of those costs relating to the archive um, so I am going to give you, because I keep talking about the archive, I'm going to give you a demonstration of the larger archive, but maybe the next thing we should do is maybe ask Graham to tell us a little bit about the EVA conference. So the EVA conference is, it takes place, EVA London, we're talking about, <coughs> takes place in London every year, and CAS is the main supporter of that within the, um, the sort of BCS, British Computer Society movement. So do you want to tell us a little bit about EVA, Graham? Yeah, sure. Um... July the 10th to 14th this year will be Eva's 33rd consecutive year of running. So it's been around for an awfully long time. Uh, and originally it was held in various universities uh, and from about 2013, um, it was sponsored by the British Computer Society, uh, BCS, and obviously joined up with the Computer Arts Society along the way. Um, we get delegates from all over the world. Um, obviously, we've had a difficult time through the pandemic one way and another and had to go online for a, a couple of conferences. But financially, we've managed to survive doing that by various devious means that I won't go into. Uh, and this year, um, we're slightly down on the, the, the number of proposals that we have, um, but I think that's to do with the university sector in general rather than anything else. But the quality of the proposals we had were quite outstanding. So we've got a very good four or five day conference. Uh, it may be four days and then we might do something with students from colleges all over London. Uh, I'm working on that idea at the moment. Uh, every evening during the conference, we have a, a special event, and the Monday evening will be the Computer Arts Society event, which even if you haven't in, uh, uh, registered to come on the conference, anyone who's listening to this who can be in London is very welcome to just come along and join us for. Um, there will be another evening which will be a flux in art or another one of our partners in crime on, the, uh, on EVA London and they will have a social with speakers. And again, you can visit that one um, and we'll take it from there. Though, If you have a look at our website, which is evalondon.org, 
then um, you can you can keep yourselves updated. Uh, what we do, apart from having all the proposals which are peer reviewed, um, we publish our papers on Science Open, and we also now print in full colour uh, 75 copies of our proceedings with an ISBN number. And for researchers who are trying to get funds or um, up their career prospects, this can be very useful. At the moment, I'm working with the research workshop, which is an idea that I've been, been close to my heart for some years, which is for um, postgraduate students, non-affiliated artists who have work in progress. It's stuff that isn't ready to be a full conference paper yet. Uh, it's on its way. And they can bring this along, have a two page paper published, but more important, probably present to a group of some of the finest academics in digital art around who will make suggestions to them on how they could improve things, do things, collaborate with whatever. And quite often um, the research workshop ends up with someone coming back a couple of days later with a full paper, sometimes with somebody they met at the EVA conference, which is sort of rather nice. Um, apart from that, we get involved in other academic activities. Uh, one at the moment that um, Jonathan Bowen and, and Tula Giannini are involved in is making a new book for Springers. And I am writing a chapter in that along with many other people. So it's got a, it's got a very sound academic side to it. But also the research workshop allows me to pick the most eclectic and crazy ideas from young people and stir them into the mix, even if they wouldn't be full, con full conference papers. And uh, I think people find them great fun to do. So we're, we've been there for 33 years. Uh, we're, we're, we're still going. Love the idea of having a um, CAS, uh, a contemporary CAS and Eva, um, Eva Artworks show, uh, which I'd like to make into a big show if possible all over Eva and we'll work on that and make an SFR for that. If you are in London, um, you can certainly come to all our evening activities for free without uh, enrolling. Uh, if you're not in London, then you can uh, enroll online uh, for a small fee, uh, or you can come along just for a day or two, have a look at it, see what you think, and um, meet lots of people with an idea of actually writing a proposal of some sort for next year. Uh, we're also looking out for keynote speakers, symposium speakers, and things like that. And I have a hunch that some of the people who are sitting there might actually fill that role in future years. So uh, you can get in touch with me that way. I think that's about me a lot. Great, thanks, Graham. Okay, so um, yes, try, try to get involved in either, even if it just means um, participating in our um, CAS evening on the Monday night. All the information will be on the website about when those events are. And of course, you can link to the EVA website from here as well. Um, OK, so feel free, obviously, to have a look around um, the new website. Join our email list. That's probably the best way to make sure that you're kept up to date with Computer Arts Society stuff. I know an email list seems a little bit old fashioned with all the social media stuff around. But I reckon email lists will still be here when Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, have disappeared. It is quite a good way, particularly with this One Direction mailing list from the news, to keep in touch with people. We do, saying that, we do have Facebook, and that's a great place to chat um, and to share news. We have an Instagram. Um, oh, okay, very new. Only allow essential cookies. Oh, it's going to want me to sign in, isn't it? Okay, well, we are going to have, there we go. Instagram, and that will start to be used fairly soon. I think it'd be nice to post material from the archive and the set and the other there. Um, we also, likewise, Twitter. We do have a Twitter which we haven't been using, but we also have a YouTube channel which not only has all of the talks, but has the last three years of the EVA conference available, as well as additional materials. And maybe you've got some video material that you want to put somewhere that's safe on, online. And that's building up a decent subscriber base. That's 660 people have subscribed to that. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's the launch, if you like, of the new website. Now, what I also wanted to show you is the next phase of, of work on archiving. 
Now, if I take you to compute, this is the dev version of Computer Arts Archive. The live version has a lot less on it. Um, I'd like to get this live, well, definitely before Eva, because I'm presenting a paper about it. But ideally, within a, a month or so, I'd like to see this in this form available online. So the Computer Arts Archive Kick. A Kick is a community interest company. It's a type of non-profit company in the UK, very lightweight to run. The idea is you don't have to liaise with the charity commission or the other things. As long as you don't profiteer, you make profit, all the money stays within the archive and is spent in a clear and um, within the kick and is spent in a clear and honest way. Very, very little um, management of the um, company structure needed. And the Computer Arts Art Archive kick is where we're going to be collecting and storing all of our archival materials. Now, at the moment, prior to launch, these are the sections that I would like to be able to publish. So a couple of months maybe, and I'd like to feel that all of these are in a reasonable form. Now, this tends to be a collection of stuff that we physically own, and the archive physically has in its store. So in the CAS archive, you will see some websites that look familiar, but other things that we've managed to acquire and we have physical copies of, but in many cases, actually, some of these are digital, such as ideas before their time. I mentioned that, but we have the catalogue, we have photographs, and then we have the Technocultures project that was behind it. Um, intuition and ingenuity. We have the catalogue that Anna um, donated. Um, we have photographs, uh, the original website, which I've grabbed a copy of, but I don't point to that. I point to the live one, just in case and then photographs and the various showings. While Paul is here, I will quickly show Brown, um, Brown and Son, that exhibition. Uh, we have videos that you gave, video talks that you gave. Um, we have the talks, Fred and Arca's talk, other things. Now, of course, many of these are on YouTube. What we're doing is pointing to them, but things like the art that makes itself book and all your additional materials that you've recently donated, these will be listed in the archive. So it'd be a great resource for people interested in Paul um, and Danny's work. Technology is not neutral. We have a catalogue, um, associated material, posters and things like that. that again, Anna has um, sent over. And as you'll see, if you look through this archive, Computer Art Society has generated or been involved in a lot of projects. But there are bound to be some that we've missed. So when this goes live, one of the things I'd want to do is put a call out for missing bits to add to our traditional ephemera materials. We have the CAS 50 collection, which are all the physical artworks that we've collected so far, of which there are quite a few. We have some really great work in there, and we're looking to add to that. We have, um, this probably won't display. We have the EBA archive. We're doing work on the archive in the EBA conference, so that EBA London in particular, that that material is not lost. Micro arts group, um, Jeff's work. We have videos, stills, copies of his micro arts magazine, and so on. And a lot of physical things, so ZX spectrums, and this, that, and the other. And that would become part of the archive. And then I have two of my personal collections that are now going to be on long term loan for the archive. One is a collection of material relating to Howard Cohen, sort of. Um, I think hopefully everyone knows Harold Cohen and respects his work, but I think he's becoming increasingly seen as an important pioneer um, of not just digital art, but also AI in art. So, for example, art articles, information about my victories, wrong with us. And then a nice collection of photographs that I took um, in 2014. Um, nice pictures of Harold, that sort of thing. But then within this collection, I've been very interested in Harold's work for a very long time. I've got a collection of materials that will make quite a nice Harold Cohen exhibition, actually. So a few original pieces. These are now part of the archive. Um, I have some of his drawings from the plotter. But personally, I have a very big interest in how he transitioned, to use the current term, from being a painter to being a digital artist. And so I have focused a lot of my collecting on the late 60s. So you'll see this work here, which is very reminiscent of some of his digital pieces, but this wasn't a digital piece. This was from 1965. 
And I've even got some fabrics and things like that. And then a lot of books, a um, number of which are signed, and then ephemera, um, page, issues of page, other magazines, this, that, and the other, and additional resources. So this will become part of the archive. I'm not yet donating all the materials to the archive, but they are available for online research. And I'd like to feel that we can start exhibiting this more widely in the future. And then I have a similar interest in cybernetic serendipity, very important um, 1968 conference, very important because it led to the foundation of the Computer Art Society, amongst other things. Um, so a collection of videos from YouTube, these are linking over to YouTube from the curator, but then also images that have been I've collected over the years, posters, original posters, prints, a lot of books and written material, um, magazine reviews of the exhibition, so associated context and music, um, other journals and magazines and whatever. So this would make a nice exhibition about cybernetic serendipity. And again, it's available within the Computer Arts Archive digitally, and maybe in the future we might look at exhibiting this. And you know, let's imagine as the archive grows with Kaz's support, you've got an exhibition of materials from these seminal early works and cybernetic serendipity, and maybe some early Howard Cohen, but we're also able to put it next to contemporary work or work maybe 10, 20 years old, and you get to see how the history of digital art has gone on for over 50 years, 60 years, maybe even 70 years. It's not just a new thing. And I think, that, like I say, that's something important that CAS can do to demonstrate that history. So like I say, this will be online within a um, couple of months, I hope. And it will be, oops, my email. It will be something that will support what we have here in terms of Computer Arts Society, what it's doing now. There'll be that additional material in the background. So I'm just gonna check my agenda because there was something I wanted to do after showing the archive. But then I think we should chat. What's that other thing? I'm trying to find my, uh, got a lot of windows open. Um, okay. It's hidden away somewhere in my notepad. That's okay. I, I think I have covered everything. So really, so our sort of open evening, you've seen how CAD is going to be presenting itself in the future. We're going to focus on doing talks. We're going to make sure that we have exhibitions running on a regular basis. There will be opportunities to get involved in both the talks and the exhibition program. You can recommend talks or you can, um, someone else there, um, or you can even organize your own. And if they're within our sort of general interests, we'll promote them as CAS related talks. The membership really should have that opportunity. And with the exhibitions, we'll start off small, but who knows, maybe um, we'll start having bigger exhibitions in multiple locations. And then I also mentioned the open exhibition, which I would like to see as an annual event. Initially, we will call out for work that can be printed and shown in the same way Ernest exhibition is here. But if we're able to get resources, that would be great to have an annual exhibition that also included work on screen and 3D work and so on. So a big benefit of being a member of the Computer Arts Society will be that you can participate in the open and you can participate in coming up with talks and that and the other, and where possible, we can support people in doing that. Although it's worth saying that CAS does not have very much money. That's something we want to address in the future, but we're not really uh, a source of income for people, I'm afraid. But we can certainly, if you know, little bits of money are needed to help make something happen, you never know, we might be able to find it. So that's where we are now. You've seen the archive as well. I think what would be good would be to open it up if for any questions and discussion, and, and maybe anybody, in particular the um, committee members who got any feedback or um, want to answer any other questions, feel free to just crop in. I'll, I'll do the thing, I'll, I'll try and keep an eye out for little hands up or people physically raising their hand. Otherwise, um, when you, you want to add something, just try and um, join in. So any questions, I guess, first of all. Okay, I will open it up. I'll switch it the other way around. Is there anybody who would like to do a talk or be participate in our talk program in some way? I'm looking at you, William. <laughs> Adrian's waving his hand. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a talk, Sean. Brilliant. Okay, that would be good. Yeah. Yep. Um, it'd be great to look at some of your newer work as well as your historic work. You're doing some interesting stuff. Yeah. Yep. We're going black and white. 
moment. Mm. Oh, yeah. okay, nice. Yeah. So yeah, no, happy happy to talk about the new work and using physics. Ah, great, That's yeah. Evolutionary system, yeah. I will drop you a line and we'll get you into the yeah. program. Brilliant. Great thing, the archive taking shape. Really interesting. Yes. Um, uh, now, one, one, one problem there, of course, was um, the, the lockdown and COVID. A little problem, maybe, in the bigger scheme of things. But we're probably, we are definitely over two years behind of where I wanted to be. But actually, it's ended up being a good thing because we've ended up getting further ahead in other areas. So um, in the long term, it's not a problem that, yes, the lockdown and so on would slow things up a bit. Um, maybe I could ask actually Adrian, who I see is here, he's, he's producing, or we're talking about producing the Quantel paint box exhibition. And he had an uh, exhibition fairly recently um, up in Blackpool. And we'll look at taking materials from that. So um, Adrian, I know we're, we're due a talk, but did you want to say a little bit about your exhibition? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so this year is the 50th anniversary of, the, of Quantel's founding. Um, and actually two days ago, after after nine months wait, I actually spoke to Paul Keller. I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Keller. Um, Paul Keller was one of the founders. He actually came up with the idea of the paint box. He ran the paint box. He's got a million awards. He spent his retirement um, uh, getting the Alan Turing's bomb computer working again. So um, it's funny because we were talking about, um, uh, you know, obviously Adobe and they had this uh, legal battle in the 90s and which was a successful company. Um, and the, the founders of Adobe list in their Wikipedia page, their interest is things like skiing. Uh, whereas Paul Keller has spent his retirement restoring Alan Turing's computer. So <laughs> I think that shows the contrast of what their aims were. Um, so yeah, basically I, uh, Paul said, and he's never done this, uh, he said he's really happy to support the exhibition and also uh, a talk that I came up with the idea of a panel talk. Uh, at the time, I thought the exhibition was going to go to BCS as well, not just Leicester. So I don't know, we need to maybe have a chat about that, but it's easier. Oh, it will to go to BCS, but it'll probably be early 24 now. Yeah, I was obviously tying in with the 50th anniversary would have been... OK, but well, nothing's uh, fixed. If, if we yeah. need to, we can swap things around. Yeah. No, and it could be, you know, just for a week or something. It's quite a nice symbolic yeah. thing, but definitely we could get Paul to London and participate in that, which that would be a really spectacular thing to have him talk literally for the first time about the whole of Quantel. Um, so I know you offered me uh, an exhibition of my work, Work great, um, but, but what I wanted to do there's twenty images, um, twenty frames, one one frame for each decade, and uh, and make that about Quantel and the impact that Quantel really had on digital art. Um, so that's what I plan to do. Uh, I mean, it changes the title a bit, but so for instance, I um, have. Um, this was, you remember, it was called uh, it was called paint boxed when you digitally manipulated an image before it was called photoshopped. Uh, so that's Kim Manis Abbott who designed that cover on the paint box. Uh, she now runs a, a design consultancy studio in Holland. So she's agreed to do the poster for the show and the layout of those five um, frames. And then there's one, what they call a graphic paint box, which is a photo quality paint box left. And the guy who's got the last, who worked at Quantel, who's got the last graphic paint box that's working, said that he would put everything together on the graphic paint box. So I kind of like that whole thing where it's, you know, it's bringing in all these people like full circle, you know, rather than it just be about me. Um, yeah, well, that sounds good, yeah. Well, we'll talk more about the detail and the dates. But I think it's important that the paint box, um, I'm not going to say it's the number things before it, but it was the first product, commercial product, that I labelled digital manipulation. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, obviously yeah. there was a Dick Shoop and, the, you know, Super Paint and all those kind of mm, things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I it, it basically, the thing with the paint box, and I, it, the thing I can most compare it to is Google search engine. 
Mm. Well, Google search engine affects everybody's life, but nobody will ever see the little rack that's got your data whirring around in it. So everything that was pretty much appeared on everyone's TV screens from news graphics to weather to TV commercials to pop videos, all those effects pretty much were done on the Quantel paint box or other systems in the 80s. Um, so it really introduced digital art into everybody's homes via television, which we all watched for hours on end. Uh, but nobody ever heard of it because it was, you know, 200,000 pounds and in a post-production studio or a TV studio. So it's not, you know, the ZX Spectrum is obviously more well known than the paint box. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's kind of good in a way because nobody's ever heard of it. So for instance, the poster for Silence of the Lambs or the Nirvana, uh, album cover with the baby in the water chasing the dollar bill, they were done on paint box. <laughs> Everyone just assumes it was Photoshop, uh, but it was before Photoshop existed. So it kind of makes it nice because people will recognize these amazing images and I've found lots of work by, I've got the original art by Keith Herring uh, that nobody's ever seen uh, uh, by David Hockney, uh, whose show opened yesterday, um, uh, his uh, immersive show. So again, it's like you said before, all this, all this stuff has all been discussed mm. by different people before. Um, I'm sure this is familiar with all of you, but there's a really great discussion by these paint box artists, French. And the discussion was who owns the art? Who owns digital art? And somebody said, well, you can't take it away from, from the computer computer you can't because once you remove it from the computer it's in another form so really the discussion was that the computer owns the art because you can never have it the computer owns it and i thought that was a really interesting philosophical thing so like you said before all these you know ideas about like photoshop you know what does that mean it's great how you can move things around but then you've got fake news you've got body dysmorphia from distortion of supermodels all that kind of stuff. So it, it's a huge topic, the paint box, uh, and you know the decade that it was in and what what it uh, heralded. Uh, but it's just never been revealed, which just means it's an absolute treasure of stuff. So yeah, I think it's an important thing for us to look at and be involved in, sort of contextualizing really as well. Um, yeah. So, but um, artists, I think David Hockney made good use of it, didn't he, as well? So. Well, this is the thing. Everyone thinks so. So I did an analysis of his painting with light episode. I spoke to all these people, you know, went through the images, whatever. Firstly, the, the Hockney Foundation lists it as 1986. They, they don't even get it right. It's 1985. And basically everyone thinks, that, oh, Hockney went on the paint box and then, it, you know, that he got into digital art. That was 1985. He next, he, his next things were with colour copies and photocopies. And he didn't do anything digital until the iPhone, which was 2007 or eight. So you can't really say when it's literally a 23 year difference or whatever, that somebody was inspired into digital art. And he's never mentioned it. He's never done shows about it, never done anything the, about it. So I think the exhibition will be interesting and we'll also arrange a sort of opening event and talk. And you, you talked about being around in um, May or June this year. Yep, my mum's 88 in May 22nd, so I can't miss my mum's birthday. Always yeah. come back for that. So, so we'll be able to do some sort of um, small event um, in Leicester as well. To come definitely. With that. And, and like we did with the, uh, with the uh, 40th anniversary of the paint box, I'm definitely happy and can pull together, you know, for a virtual, a virtual talk as well. Great. Okay. Um, that should be so I don't know if got any um, thoughts, so um, be it on the programme or sp specific things that maybe they'd like to see and Peter Art Society look at. So, sorry, when, when is the exact 40th anniversary of the paint box? Sorry? When is the exact 40th anniversary of the paint box? Oh, well, that's missed. So, so Quantel itself was set up in uh, August 1973. The paint right. box was launched in 1981. Uh, NAB in New York so that that we did celebrate the the year that that at the end of 2021 we did the talk uh but unfortunately that's that's passed so it's 42 years 
there's always what I found out with getting into all this technology stuff. There's always some anniversary of something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Particularly at the moment, it seems. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, maybe right. that. You, I've I got, don't like to run for more than an hour, but if people have questions, yeah, William. Yeah. Um, yeah. T two points. First of all, I don't think David Hockney is a proper computer artist. <laughs> Agree. Uh, um, but the, the point I was going to make was. So, Sean, you're, you're building this amazing collection of stuff. Mm. But within that, there's lots of detail, like, you know, what happened, Slade, Middle mm. Stacks with Paul, the RCA, you know, the, there's lots of details with clusters and groupings that people would be aligned with one group and they would move to another group. And the challenge seems to be at the moment with the collection, you've just got this big block of stuff. But within that, there is a, there's an inter interesting narrative where they, over a timeline, you know, like cyber culture came along mm -hmm. in the 90s, yeah. that had a big influence. So there's, what I'm just wondering is once you, you know, with everyone's help, I'm, gonna, I'm now going to send you some stuff. Um, you got this thing together. It seems like there's some sort of curation or mm. historical process to, separate it out a little bit um, yeah. to make it more accessible? I completely agree. I think having boxes of stuff is interesting in, its, in some respects, but it's actually the context and putting it together in the narratives that are the really interesting bits. Um, one thing I want to do is to start a podcast series, and this will be discussions around particular topics and areas. Podcasts are easier to make than films. It'd be nice to have somebody, a filmmaker involved in this, but initially podcasts, and I would certainly be up for talking if people have a topic that needs investigating, talking about that and producing a podcast. I think also other people can get involved, of course, you know, we've got the materials here, but they're moderately accessible. It's not an ideal location, but um, I'm hoping to move it to a local university. And it could be the place where people come do some research to help build up those digital art histories. And it, it, I mean, it would be good just to have, for people who don't know different parts or just in general sense, mm. it would be good to have a timeline, a simple to look at yeah. timeline on, on the website. Timelines have been produced actually by CAS members in the past. Maybe we should um, create, a, yeah, create a new one and allow people to edit it. So it's a, a sort of a, a group um, project. Mm. Yeah, I like the sound of that. Oh. Hello, um, my name is David Collison. I was just wondering if I could uh, add in a few questions, please. Um, so my background, I've been a member of the BCS for decades, but my background is very much commercial IT and banking, and I don't really have an arts background. But this seems like a fascinating kind of group to, to be part of, and thank you very much for tonight. What I'd like to explore is what the boundaries are of what's considered art in the sense of creativity versus... Um, kind of graphic design and data visualization. So for me, there are things like ASCII art, uh, tiling patterns, mathematical curves, um, tube maps, kind of, I'm, even though the tube map isn't a map and it isn't of the tube, uh, mm -hmm. things like that, or in the work and data visualization going all the way back to Florence Nightingale. So I was just wondering how much of the focus of the, the society is on the creativity aspects and does it also embrace the more kind of kind of logical, and I don't mean that in a negative mm. sense. The more the more data driven, factual content is is that beyond the pale, or is that within well, the scope of the society? I can only really give you my opinion. Others might, um, maybe Paul might want to say something. For me, generally, to be art, it has to be work that was created as art. Now, I'm not saying all art has to be like that, but when it comes to digital art. So it's where the work has been created to be creative in an artistic sense, but that doesn't rule out work that we now see as art because its perception has changed over time. So uh, a lot of historic art was not made as art, but we now see it as art. Um, likewise, early computer graphics and so on were not necessarily made by artists, they might be made by designers, but we may now feel it's appropriate to include them in a discourse on art history. So mm. I think it's fine to be fuzzy around the edges and not to be too sort of dogmatic about things. 
But before, maybe if Paul was up for mentioning this, but I would say one thing to bear in mind is that probably the people involved may have an, a sort of moderately agreed idea of what art is and what art isn't. And it's fine to, to have that. I have my own idea of what is art and what isn't art. Um, and it's worth sort of trying to keep to the members' idea of what is art, but there's nothing wrong with introducing things that are not necessarily in the mainstream idea of what an artwork is. Well, yeah, I mean, thank you. I, I would be very happy if the answer to all my bits was they were out of scope. It was just I was I was keen to understand. Uh, we we what the get scope was. we we get papers in EVA London, Electronic Visualization in the Arts, which are people taking quite complex data in areas mm. and turning it into something visual, which mm. people can get almost immediately because they're seeing it as pattern shapes and forms. And, um, uh, and sequences, and um, we accept papers on that, on, on that. And they may be to do with medical, they could be to do with, um, uh, we had one which was the Battle of the River Plate, I recall, which ev where every shell that was fired was, um, was, was, was mapped yeah. and, and, and so on. Um, yeah. but, but so, yeah, it, 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 you, you wouldn't necessarily say that was art, but it is, it is using um, computers, uh, uh, electronically visualising complex data in a way in which it becomes much easier for people to understand. So I think we can go that far. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in my view as well, there's certain names of people, as William pointed out. I mean, I'm kind of cursed by the David Hockney paint box thing because that's all anyone ever talks about. Um, mm. but there's something about you can have a timeline or you can have important people etc but as with any kind of grouping and sector there are some people who end up with their name is more famous and then they become more prominent and whatever whereas maybe their contribution wasn't as important as somebody else who wasn't uh, as uh, uh, as out there in terms of pushing their their recognition etc so that's yeah, always that, that's art all over, as well. I think, isn't it? That's very much what art is like. Uh, I often yeah. think about if you think about art history, how how few how how there were so many. I mean, the the greatest example, the biggest and perhaps most scandalous example is how we're own. I mean, certainly I'm only just becoming aware of women artists who were, you know, key <laughs> players in the arts over centuries, and 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 yet they weren't they wouldn't have been on any timeline so i think anything that can do to open up open things up a bit and make more people aware of what's going on would be great yeah and conversely i mean i'm working on a documentary on the on the paint box and luckily i've got a working paint box so i can invite new artists and i've been told <clears> i have to invite you know uh inclusive artists to to balance the fact that it's mainly you know white older male artists so you know there's obviously a distortion i'm not i don't want to take this into a different direction but i'm just i'm just saying all this is about recognizing art and the artists involved so that blurred line about what is art what is design what is infographics for instance or 3d yeah. modeling or or cad design for instance you know, it is even a further blind once you start talking about the personalities involved, where they worked, you know, what mm. is, whether it was a tube map rather than a, a sewerage system, the tube map is going to get more attention, etc. Yes. So it's difficult. Thank you all. But I think they all fit within <laughs> what Kaz can um, talk about. So maybe be, be, before we finish off, you've seen the schedule that we put together our core programme, but do feel free to make additional suggestions. Um, additional events or events that we can support in some way by providing speakers. Think about as a resource for that. Um, and then a, the next scheduled meeting will be um, Paul Brown and others talking about the history of AI art on the 29th of March. Um, and I hope to see people then. Yeah, so I, unless there are any additional, um, additional questions or comments, maybe we'll um, call it a day. Um, good evening. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, my name is Ipe Kien, so I'm a curator and academician from Istanbul. Mm. And it's been a great pleasure to be here tonight, uh, listening to all of you and uh, getting to know you better. And I certainly want to be more involved uh, in the upcoming days. 
Uh, I was wondering if you're open to any like uh, international collaborations because, uh, you know, uh, I uh, teach uh, visual communication design, visual culture, I curate uh, new media art shows. So immediately when you talked about your exhibition uh, projects, I thought of maybe finding a way to introduce this mm -hmm. legacy, this uh, artistic heritage uh, here in Turkey, because it's uh, in Turkey, it's really a very uh, hype uh, field right now the field of digital arts, computer art. And uh, I was wondering whether uh, you would be interested in uh, discussing those possibilities in the future. I think everyone will say yes. I think send over <laughs> yeah. um, any ideas or suggestions and we can discuss them and get back to you. So it could be simply showing some of the exhibitions that we put together, or it could be a, yeah. a more sort of in-depth collaboration. Yeah. Obviously, all these talks are online, and the whole of Eva London, um, July 10th to 14th, will be online, including many of the evening sessions as well. So um, we could uh, we could we could take a look at uh, uh, people being able, you, your, you and your students being able to sit in on parts of that uh, and uh, explore that idea. Uh, we could send them the program in advance and they could look at areas that would be of particular interest. Um, I, I, I'm open certainly to uh, wearing my battered co-chair hat. I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to explore that with you. Why well, don't you I... send an introduction um, and some thoughts and I'll make sure that everybody on the um, organising committee has a look at it. Could, could I also recommend that maybe you have a section of computer art and history museums around the world? So yeah. ZKM and Computer History Museum, because what you'd find is that you link into them and connect mm. into them, they will probably link back and connect back and you get that kind of interaction, which will yeah, help as well. That would be good, yeah. So it'll bet us in really with the online sort of community right. out there. Well, we've, we've, we've got some we've got some very nice guests coming to either London this year to speak for us from foreign parts and the other side mm. of the pond and so on. But I'll uh, I'll, I'll leave that uh, announcement for a little later. <laughs> so make sure you join that that mailing list, which is low volume. Yeah, I set I set mine to one message maximum a day. You don't get inundated or look at the um, the Facebook, really, a Facebook group. We'll make sure everything we do goes out on those. So if you're watching those, you'll get more information. Um, and then I say on the website under contacts, there's a general inquiry info at um, address, and then some of the names sort of people on the committee, named roles, have email addresses there. So we, we should be easy enough to get in touch with. Okay. Right, I gotta go. Okay, oh, well, uh, thanks for everyone well, turning well, up, and um, see you well, next month. I, one last Thank question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. One, one last question about donating archives. For instance, 